This is a research talk, but not about my research, about uh, the research done in the natural history in London. I was privileged to be the director of the museum for 16 years. Uh, uh, it's a big research institution. And I want to talk this morning uh, about historical and public views of the museum, uh, what the museum is as a research institution and the fantastic new opportunities for research using natural history collections, which are afforded by technological advancements. So just thinking a little bit about the Natural History Museum in London, most people know the institution. It, it is the national collection of natural history objects and national collection is in initial capitals because it has a legal status. It is the official collection of the UK. Uh, it is funded by government and the government is the funder of last resort for the institution. The collection is actually a collection of collections. Uh, many, many collectors over the years have contributed to the museum's collections, uh, which consists of animals, both skeletons, skins, stuffed animals, uh, and those pickled. Uh, and we have plants, microorganisms, rocks, minerals, fossils, gemstones, and artifacts related to them. Typically, of course, the, the museum is known for specimens that have special scientific significance. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, also important is the fact that there is 200, more than 250 years of accumulated expertise related to the collection. So a great deal of institutional knowledge wrapped up in the collection of objects. And we are, we are, we are, I'm still there, <laughs> the museum is a national resource for taxonomy and systematics, the science, if you will, of classifying and naming animals, plants, etc. Most people, of course, know the museum for its public work. It has a very large audience and a very high level of public trust. The purpose of the museum is written in statute. It's actually was originally part of the British Museum and this dates back to the British Museum Act in the 1750s and there are three principal purposes of the museum. One is to maintain and take care of the collections. Second is to make those collections available for study by the curious which means the public every bit as much as for research use. And the third purpose is actually to loan the collection for exhibition or research. And that's a, a big uh, undertaking for the museum on an annual basis, as we will see. So just thinking about the public side of the museum, the museum has about 20,000 items on public display. Uh, and, and the public display is for an annual audience pre-COVID of around uh, five and a quarter million, 5.3, actually 5.4 million in the 12 months just before uh, COVID struck. Uh, and those people who visit generally spend on average about two and a half hours during their visit. Um, and the museum also loans hundreds of items annually for exhibition purposes. But the public use of the collection is actually dwarfed by the scientific use. There are actually 80 million items in the museum's collections, so only one quarter of 1% is on public display. And the museum has a scientific staff of about 350 uh, who look after and do research on those collections. We also, we, I'm still at the museum, have about 9,000 scientific visitors coming to the museum to use the collections on an annual basis. And typically those visits uh, are on average two days. So, so 18,000 visitor days use of the collections. And as opposed to the hundreds of loans per annum for exhibition purposes, there are tens of thousands of loans per year uh, for research use to researchers and research institutions all around the globe. 
So just thinking about the objects on display, uh, I suppose typically they fall into three categories. Uh, we like to show specimens that change the way we think. And the first picture below from looking from the left is actually just one such specimen. This, uh, although it hasn't got a, 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 a scale bar on it, that's a, a actually a fossilized tooth of an iguanodon. It was found in Sussex by an amateur paleontologist called Gideon Mantle. And it was identified by the great anatomist Richard Owen as a reptile tooth. Now, given that it's about four centimeters long, he speculated, and this was in the 1850s, that there must be very large, or must have been in the fossil record, very large reptiles. And he coined the, the term for these animals, which nobody had knew about at this point, dinosauria. So Richard Owen was the man who coined the term dinosaurs. The second picture um, represents specimens which, when combined with others, tell stories which il illustrate scientific principles. These are some of Darwin's finches from the Galapagos Islands. And even in that small picture, I think you can see the variety of beak types, um, which led to Darwin thinking uh, about his theory of, e of evolution by natural selection. Uh, and we also display specimens that are aesthetically pleasing or visually interesting. And the third picture there is actually of the first discovered Neanderthal skull. So I mentioned 80 million objects in the museum's collections, and here is how they're distributed. About 7 million fossils, about four, 400,000 or so mineralogical samples, rocks, minerals, etc. Uh, six million plants, fantastic number of insects. And of course, in Britain, we are uh, historically uh, important collectors of things like uh, butterflies and beetles. Uh, so some massive collections. And of course, there are a great many uh, species of insects. Um, very large uh, zoological collections and also a, a very large li library and archive collection, probably the biggest natural history collection um, in the world. Type specimens are interesting because they are the gold standard for a species. So when a species is first described, the very individual used for that description is written up in, in a scientific paper uh, and it form and uh, it, 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 it is uh, collect, kept as a voucher specimen uh, uh, in, in, in a great museum. Um, the Natural History Museum London has over a million type specimens, including mineralogical uh, uh, specimens, uh, by far the biggest collection of types in any museum in the world. The physical register we'll, we'll come back to a little later. Before we move on to think about the collections and how they're used, I just want to give you a sense of how big a collection of 80 million objects is. So there is a, a, a phrase to describe a famous uh, item in the museum's collection. In fact, Dippy, the, the replica Diplodocus, which stood in the central hall uh, until a few years ago. And you can read those words in roughly five seconds. And if I gave you a complete list of those 80 million objects uh, described in five second uh, uh, items like that, it would take you working office hours, 63 years, one month and 10 days to read the list. That is a, a, a phenomenally uh, large collection. Uh, and a phenomenally large collection requires an awful lot of space to store it. And in fact, uh, the museum has about 72,000 square meters of storage space, roughly equivalent to 10 rugby pitches. Um, and that includes compactorized collections where drawers and cabinets up to two meters in height are on roller racks to save space. And if uh, you want another comparison, a good sized four bedroom house would be about 3,000 square meters. So uh, a good many uh, houses. Most of the collections are, of course, analog, and, uh, and the records often uh, are in 
paper-based systems in registries and some primitive databases were created and have evolved over the decades. Um, many of these evolved independently of each other, so they're not uh, in a common format or structure. And of course, ideally, that's what, what you need if you're going to start using uh, big data, uh, common formats uh, and well-structured data records. But today I want to focus mostly on technology as a driver of change. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit about four technologies which have advanced massively in the last few years uh, and have uh, thrown new light on even the oldest things in the museum's collections. I'm going to talk a little bit about imaging, chemical analysis, genomics and big open data. So first of all, imaging. This is, uh, the picture on the left is a pickle, so it's stored in uh, uh, ethanol, uh, example of a hairy anglerfish, a very rare species of anglerfish, probably only a dozen ever caught around the world. And this one has this amazing uh, distended stomach. Uh, scientists at the museum for Many years have wondered what was in the stomach of the anglerfish, what it had eaten, as it would throw some light onto the ecology of the fish. But of course, being such a rare specimen, they didn't want to dissect it and find out. Um, but nowadays, the museum has a micro CT scanning facility. Uh, so if you will, think of medical CT scanning, but as something about a hundred times more powerful. So what you do is you put an object in this scanner, uh, uh, it, it rotates and takes a series of X-ray pictures, which can then be assembled into a 3D computer model. And the picture on the right is a, a still picture of that 3D model. So you can see the jaws of the anglerfish. Um, and because CT scanning will pick out material of different densities, you can select for the bones of the fish involved. So you can see the backbone of the anglerfish, but you can also see the backbone of the fish that the anglerfish has eaten. So even though this uh, has been in the museum's collections for a long time, and our scientists didn't know what the uh, fish that the anglerfish had eaten was, they've been able to work out by looking at the ear ossicles, which are in this region here, this is a lens of one of the fish that's been eaten eyes. Um, they've been able to work out from the ear ossicles the species of fish that, this, that the anglerfish has eaten. So throwing new light and new information about the, the life history of the hairy anglerfish. Um, and CT scanning can be used to do uh, some incredible things. You can look at, at uh, uh, fossils inside rocks. You can use it to uh, uh, digitally strip layers of paint off canvas and look at uh, paintings underneath or painted over um, to see what the, the original artwork looked like. So a uh, wide range of applications, not just in natural history. We'll talk a little bit about chemical analysis. This, uh, the pictures here show uh, baleen plates from Hope the Whale that was suspended in the uh, Central Hall from 2017. And um, using isotope analysis, despite the fact that this whale died in 1891, we've been able to work out quite a bit about the last years of her life. Now, if you can see in this picture, little grooves are, of baleen plate have been removed and uh, subjected to isotope analysis. And the reason for this is that baleen plates grow like fingernails during the life of a whale. So that each spot down the baleen whale represents a different time in the, in the whale's life. Uh, and our scientists have been able to compare the isotope signal in the baleen plate, which is uh, relatively unaffected as it is laid down. And, and in other words, it doesn't change subsequently. By comparing the isotope signals with known signals from the world's oceans, our scientists have been able to map the last seven years of Hope the Whale's life, where she spent some time in the Azores, migrated north to the Arctic Ocean, um, uh, migrated back again to the Azores, 
and ultimately uh, up and died off the coast of Ireland where she was stranded. Um, so incredible that although this whale died 120 years ago, we've been able to map where she was in the last uh, seven years of her life. Uh, and perhaps more significantly, work is now being done on stress hormones and pregnancy hormones, also from laid down in the baleen plates, um, that will tell us that uh, whether Hope was pregnant, as we know from the modern studies of blue whales, that, that the uh, visits to the Azores are, are often um, associated with giving birth. I want to talk a little bit about genomics um, and some work uh, that's now possible due to the fantastic uh, advances in, in, in genomics in recent years. So it's possible, for example, to fog trees in a Borneo forest, so collect all the beetles uh, in a tree, um, blend them, and then use uh, molecular biology, use uh, a, a whole series of uh, techniques to create a phylogeny, a, a family tree, if you will, of the species in, the, in those trees. And in fact, this is an example of, of of that work. Uh, it's a family tree of beetles from Borneo forests. You can see the family names of some of those beetle families. And uh, molecular biology now enables us to identify known species, which are shown colored in this chart, and unknown species, though that those that are new to science. And you can see there are a huge number. Uh, and the, uh, it points to the fact that although we have described a great many species, there are huge numbers of species that are currently uh, as yet uh, unrecorded. Um, if you just consider the two right-hand bars on this, on this chart, about 1.3 million species of eukaryotic uh, organisms have been uh, described to date. Uh, there are various estimates, and here is one, of how many species are probably out there in total. Um, this estimate is that there are just under 9 million species out there to be discovered. If you look at the distribution from birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and you see uh, how small those bars become in, uh, in the predicted species number, you can see that uh, invertebrates and insects completely dominate and that there are an awful lot of microbes out there as well. Now the point about this uh, genomic approach to looking for species is that since the 1960s, science has been describing about 15,000 new species a year. And although the estimated number of species varies very widely from sort of low end numbers of around 4 million to uh, a few people who speculate there could be anything up to 100 million species out there. The traditional approach of descriptive taxonomy is, is really just too slow for meaningful progress. If there are only 4 million species, it will take another 200 years to find and describe them all, progress that is clearly too slow. So we can build phylogenetic trees from field sampling. We can compare sequences with known uh, species from voucher collections in museums and one can then think about targeted sampling for species that may be interesting to look for to name and describe and it's interesting could be for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, many uh, org uh, organisms for example have interesting metabolic pathways that we might want to uh, utilize and adopt. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about big data, and this is a screenshot of the Natural History Museum's data portal. And you can see it says search 4.7 million of the museum's 80 million specimens. Um, it's a relatively small number because digitizing the collections is an enormous undertaking. And when thinking about digitizing collections, it's important to think about not just the image, 
because the image of the specimen is actually probably less important than the metadata, the information that's held about that collection item. Even at its simplest, what is it, when and where was it collected, enables you to create a geospatial temporal map of species distribution. Indeed, the museum has been doing that for certain species and comparing those distributions with environmental factors like climate change. And indeed, have uh, been able to demonstrate, for example, with British butterflies, that British butterflies are emerging significantly earlier than they did 100 years ago. Uh, and, and the species of plants that those butterflies feed on are emerging earlier due to climate change. Um, digitizing collections could in future include DNA sequence information. So the amount of digital storage required for, for digital collections is going to be very large. It does raise very important questions about how do you prioritize what you're going to collect in the future and what you're going to digitize. Um, and although the costs are falling, um, it may be as cheap as one pound per item, uh, but let's say a range of one to five pounds per item, uh, building effective pipelines to do uh, mass digitization are really important. Uh, even at a pound, the museum's collections will cost 80 million pounds to digitize. At five pounds, of course, it's, it's a great deal more, 400 million. So this is a non-trivial task, but the benefits are enormous. The museum's data portal allows access to uh, NHM data and, and tools to manipulate that data. There are about 10.8 million data records at the moment. Uh, and to show you that there is a uh, use, uh, appetite to use that information, about a billion downloads per month of specimen data records have been happening uh, in, the, in the, my final months in the museum. And that is a staggering amount of uh, downloading. Um, the museum is uh, open, uh, the, the, the data is open, uh, so open licensing. There are stable, citable identifiers, so we can track how that digital data is used in the published literature, and over 600 scientific papers have been published so far using the data. Uh, there are traffic light data quality indicators, so uh, uh, some information on some of the specimens that are very old, uh, the data is of less quality than uh, more recent uh, collections. So, for example, now we would use uh, uh, data coordinates for location, so uh, using satellite data. Whereas in the olden days, it might be a, a, a butterfly from Bekuana land. So uh, the, the, the specificity of the data varies quite uh, enormously. Um, and the data portal is, of course, easy to access and to reuse and to promote collaboration. I want to just extend the thought that if the Natural History Museum does digitizes its collections, um, what about the other major museums around the world? And the museum is working in a, in a consortium of 12 institutions that between them hold about half a billion uh, collection items. And in fact, it led to a thought of could, could it be possible to, to launch a, a project which was uh, grandly titled One World Collection. And it shows a saturation curve of, of museum collections, which shows you that the top 10 institutions in the world have about half a billion specimens, the top 34, uh, uh, another half a billion, and the top 100, only another 300,000. So it's a feasible project. Uh, and indeed, there is now a collaborative effort between 70 institutions to think about how to create one world collection, to use a common approach to creating data sets. And this is a feasible project, both financially uh, and technologically. And the power of this will be enormous, huge data sets, which can be used to answer a whole range of questions. 
So the point of the talk really is to show that these disruptive technologies can re reveal significant information which historically has been locked away in specimens and that vast collections offer huge data sets to address really important questions. We can look at the distribution of species and how they respond to changing climate. We can look at a whole range of factors. In fact, the interesting thing is which questions we want to we want to address because that is the question that really should dictate which collections are, are digitized and not what i tend to call the stamp collecting approach which is we've done this family of beetles let's do the nearest uh, equivalents 